Good morning and welcome back to lesson 27 of our study of Genesis. We are plugging right along and we only have two more lessons after today's lesson and then we will have share day. Um, for our announcements this morning, uh, the first is that we are, sorry, let me get this pulled up. We are registering now for next year for our study of Matthew. So if you have any friends that were not able to attend this year, um, invite them to register now so that they can be placed and start at the first class day. Um, also rem remind them um, that we do have children's programs um, for little ones up to age 10. So if they have children that they want to bring, they can register their children now as well. Our next announcement is that we are going to have in-person share day. This is going to be on May the 12th from 9 to 1030 at Central Baptist Church. Um, we do want to continue to promote safety for you guys. We want to provide an environment where we are all safe and comfortable. So mask wearing will be required. Um, everyone will need to wear a mask when they attend to share day. We have a large worship center where we can all space out and be socially distanced while we are sharing. Um, and also just be mindful of that. We are in person and we're going to be so excited to see one another. But we're going to have to rem remember to stay a little bit distance from one another. We won't get to give each other the big hugs that we want to, um, but we will get to see each other's faces, which is really going to be a blessing, um, I think, to all of us. So May 12th from 9 to 1030, if you're not able to attend Share Day or you're not comfortable attending Share Day, we will have a computer set up so that we can Zoom. You can join a Zoom link to be able to hear those that share. You just won't be able to share yourself. So um, you can think about that and make the decision if you feel comfortable coming. We hope to see many of your faces. We have missed seeing everyone so much over this year. Um, that is all the announcements this morning. So before we begin, let me pray for us. Uh, Father, we just come to you as the almighty God who has purpose in all things, God. We know that you are always at work um, for our good and for your glory. And I just pray that through this story of Joseph, that you show that to us and that you show us how we can take that lesson and apply it to our own lives. Um, Father, we thank you for your word, and we thank you that it comes alive to us each week as we study um, and just talk with one another about the things that you reveal to us. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Have any of you ever put together a piece of furniture, specifically a piece of Ikea furniture? I love Ikea. I love to walk through the showroom area. I love to see how they have different rooms set up. I love to see how they have everything organized and how different pieces are used. And occasionally I get on an organizing kick where a certain room in my house has become out of sorts. And my solution is more often than not, go to Ikea. Their furniture is just so functional. Every design element of each piece has purpose. I enjoy picking out the pieces and envisioning what all they can contain and how tidy they'll make my unruly rooms. It's exciting to sit before that unopened box with your cordless drill in hand ready to tackle the assembly. Then you open the box. There are at least 500 screws and 45 pieces of wood crammed into that tiny little box. Now, the instructions with the little marshmallow man, let's just say those are not the most helpful. And I'm not one to ask my husband to help me because I'm not trying to have a divorce over putting Ikea furniture together. So I'm gonna do this by myself. Now, there have been times where I've gotten almost completely finished assembling something and I realize I have extra pieces. Am I supposed to have extra pieces? Do these extra pieces actually have a purpose? My finished product usually has some sort of defect. It leans a little to the left. It might have a wobble to it or the shelves don't quite sit right. So 
I have to call in the reinforcements. And what do you know? Those extra pieces, well, they do have a purpose. The purpose is sometimes invisible to the naked eye, but each and every piece provides stability for that entire piece of furniture. Each piece holds the furniture together and secures it for when it's time to load it up with all the things. And just like all 800 pieces crammed into that one box for that one piece of Ikea furniture, God has a purpose for every single circumstance in our lives. We may not always see the purpose, but it is there. And what we're going to learn today is that a believer's past is redeemed and future secured because of God's good purposes. A believer's past is redeemed and future secured because of God's good purposes. We're going to look at this text in two divisions. The first division, I forgot I have a slide for you. The first division is the past redeemed, and that's going to be Genesis chapter 45. And then the second division is going to be the future secured, and that will be Genesis chapter 46, verse 1, all the way through chapter 47, verse 12. So the past redeemed and the future secured. We left the story last week at a very much a cliffhanger moment. Joseph's cup was found in the sack of Benjamin, and the brothers tore their clothes in grief at the thought of their father losing his beloved Benjamin. Judah stepped forward and offered himself in place of Benjamin to save his father from the misery of losing another son. Can you just imagine this scene? The brothers are all weeping at the thought of losing Benjamin and what it would do to their poor father. Judah's pleading with Joseph, please take me instead. I cannot return to my father without the boy. It would kill him. Allow me to take his place as your slave. What happened next was the surprise ending of the century. Joseph was finally so overcome with emotion, he could no longer keep his secret. He demanded his attendants leave him alone with the men. At this moment, he revealed his true identity to his brothers. I am Joseph. Is my father still living? The brothers were speechless, in shock and terrified at this revelation. Joseph sensed their fear and disbelief, so he quickly spoke to reassure them. He again reaffirmed his kinship and added that he was the one they sold into slavery. But Joseph didn't stop there. He did not leave the guilt of their terrible action hanging over their head. Joseph continued by offering them not just forgiveness, but an opportunity for reconciliation. What is reconciliation and how is it different from forgiveness? Reconciliation is a work by which broken relationships are restored. Reconciliation assumes a broken relationship. In this story, the relationship between Joseph and his brothers was obviously broken by the betrayal that the brothers had committed many, many years before. Full reconciliation involves both the willingness to forgive and repentance on the part of the forgiven. It's not a one-way street. Now, Joseph had already forgiven his brothers, as demonstrated by his generosity in providing grain to his family at no cost. But he took it a step further by seeking to restore the relationship with his family as he revealed his true identity to them. Joseph carefully observed his brothers while they appeared before him in Egypt, searching for heart change as he tested their attitudes and behaviors towards one another, their father, and particularly toward the youngest brother, Benjamin. Joseph saw the distress brought on to his brothers when they believed Benjamin would be taken as a slave. 
He watched Judah sacrifice himself to take the place of Benjamin out of care for its, for his father. The evidence of a repentant heart is before Joseph and the stage is set for reconciliation. How could Joseph move forward with these men who had caused him so much hurt and suffering? Why would he even want to rebuild a relationship with them? Well, the answer is found right in our text in Joseph's own words in verses five through nine. Joseph told his brother, starting in verse five, now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. In fact, three times in three verses, Joseph told his brothers that their hatred and evil actions toward him were by divine appointment. The point of emphasis seems to be the divine perspective. God's plan preceded the actions of the brothers. God's determination to make something good out of them was not an afterthought on his part. It was God that preserved and elevated Joseph. Joseph demonstrated complete trust in God. He knew that God had been present with him every step of the way, from being sold into slavery, traded to work in Potiphar's house, wrongly accused and thrown into prison, forgotten by those he helped, to elevated to a position of authority second only to Pharaoh. God was there. And not only was God present, he had purpose in all of those trials. Joseph could see some of that purpose now, and he wanted his brothers to understand it as well. Verse 6 reveals that the famine would continue for another five years, which led into the second acknowledgement of God's purpose in verse 7. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Talk about purpose not only to save their lives during a famine, but preserving a remnant, this remnant of Israel, the small remaining quantity of God's people. Joseph saw the big picture. He had right thinking. This wasn't just about him and his brothers. This was bigger. This involved the purposes of God advancing throughout the course of human history for the glory of God and the good of his people. This had to provide a tremendous source of comfort for Joseph. The certainty that God's will, not man's, was, control, was the controlling force in every event that had taken place was a right worldview. If Joseph had not survived and been put in that position during this famine, the nation of Israel would have been wiped out. We see in Joseph a foreshadowing of a much greater savior that would eventually come through Joseph's own family, through the line of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Both Joseph and Jesus were loved by their fathers, rejected by their brothers. They were sold for the price of a slave. Both were tempted and falsely accused and Joseph and Jesus were both exalted by God after a season of suffering. They both forgave those who harmed them and both were sent by God to save his people. Now that Joseph has offered grace and forgiveness to his brothers, he instructed them to bring his father and their families to Egypt. He wanted to provide for them. He wanted to see his father and to have the opportunity to rebuild the relationships that were shattered so many years before. At that, he threw his arms around his brothers weeping. In verse 15, it even says, afterward his brothers talked with him. These are the same brothers who way back in chapter 37 hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. What a beautiful picture of complete reconciliation. The news quickly spread throughout the palace. 
Joseph had probably hidden his family origin from Pharaoh out of shame that his own brothers had sold him into slavery. But now the Egyptians learned that Joseph came from a respected family. Pharaoh was grateful for how Joseph not only saved Egypt from starvation, but even made Egypt wealthy. He was delighted to reward Joseph through his family and directed Joseph to bring his entire family to Egypt. The brothers returned to Canaan with provisions, clothing, and money, along with wagons to carry their wives, children, and elderly back to Egypt. As they left, Joseph said, don't quarrel on the way. Joseph knew that old habits die hard, and so he wanted to ensure that they did not degenerate into fighting on their journey. When the brothers arrived in Canaan and told Jacob that Joseph was alive, to say that he was in shock would be an understatement. We're only given a brief glimpse into that conversation, but I imagine that there was a lot of explaining and confessing as they gave their father the news. Jacob's shock and unbelief eventually wore off at the, in the sight of the carts coupled with the words sent from Joseph revived his spirit, and he had no hesitation about going to Egypt. And so that leads us to our first truth. God can restore what sin has destroyed. God can restore what sin has destroyed. The sins of many people contributed to the suffering of Joseph. Sin destroyed the relationship between father, son, and brother. But God, God had a plan. God was able to use the mess made to preserve a remnant. And in the process, bring about reconciliation. Joseph's brothers being made right with Joseph after all these years is reconciliation made possible by the work of God. And just as God worked to bring about reconciliation in this family, he does the same thing with us through the work of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us, whether we acknowledge it or not, are separated from God because of our sin. We are at odds with God. That is simply the reality. Because of Jesus' suffering and death on the cross, that punishment for sin and separation from God was absorbed by him. And that has been done so that we may experience reconciliation with God. Everyone who acknowledges their sin and separation from God and trusts in Jesus for forgiveness is reconciled to God. When God forgives, he does not stop until he reconciles the forgiven sinner with himself. We saw Joseph forgive his brothers and then pursue reconciliation with them. His trust in God and God's grace propelled him to extend grace to relationships in his own life in need of reconciliation. We desperately need to be right with God and right with each other. If we as a Christian community truly believe, I'm sorry, I lost my place, truly believe in reconciliation, it changes how we interact with others. Our world is filled with division. People are at odds with each other for any number of reasons, from politics, race, dysfunction in families, hurt feelings, conflict between church denominations, and even strained relationships within a church body. And so I ask you today, where is their division that you can initiate reconciliation? Who do you need to forgive? Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And Jesus even taught in Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 and 24. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. 
then come offer your gift. The time for reconciliation is now. When we repent of our sins and God forgives us, he releases us from the penalty of being separated from him forever. When we forgive others, we release them from the penalty of personal separation. As believers, once we have been reconciled to God in Christ, we know that our future is secured. As we move forward in our story to chapter 46, we see how God had secured the future for the family of Israel. So Jacob sets out with his entire family to head to Egypt. He didn't travel very far before he paused at Beersheba to offer sacrifices. Beersheba was the southernmost boundary of the land. It was the point of departure into the desert that separated Egypt from Canaan. Now, Beersheba was also the place where both Isaac and Abraham had built altars to worship God. Jacob refused to move further until he had confirmation that this move was in God's will. Let me read verses two through four to you. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. These three verses reveal so much about the nature of who God is. First, he is personal. He called Jacob's name and spoke directly to Jacob's concern. He said, do not be afraid to go to Egypt. God is not only personal, but he is all knowing. He knew what was on Jacob's mind. Jacob went to worship in Beersheba, but he didn't even have to reveal his thoughts, his fears, or his insecurities to God. God already knew, and so he spoke into that. Why would Jacob be afraid to go to Egypt? It's likely that Jacob was thinking about the command that God had given his own father, Isaac. And back in, cha in chapter 26, verse 2, there was another famine, and God specifically told Isaac not to go to Egypt in search of food. Jacob may have even been thinking further back to the serious trouble that his grandfather Abraham had gotten into when he traveled to Egypt, and that was way back in chapter 12. As God continued to speak to Jacob in this vision, he made four promises to Jacob. He promised to make Jacob into a great nation, to be with him in Egypt, that he would bring Jacob back again to the land of Canaan, and that Jacob would be with Joseph at his death. Now, from our side of the cross, we see that these promises will be fulfilled. But Jacob did not know what God would accomplish through these promises. He did know that God's covenant promise first made to Abraham had not changed. He knew that God had remembered and kept his covenant throughout generations, Abraham to Isaac and now himself. Jacob knew that this covenant keeping God was going with him and his family to Egypt. He wouldn't leave them. And with that knowledge, Jacob was confident to move forward. In verse 5, Jacob loaded his entire family up and left Beersheba. Jacob was wise to seek God's blessing before continuing on his journey to Egypt. We can follow Jacob's example as we make decisions in our daily lives. Before making decisions, pause and seek the Lord in prayer for wisdom, guidance, and clarity. Once you have found a peace in your decision, confidently move forward in obedience. Now, verses 8 through 25 include the names of the family members who accompanied Israel into Egypt. These lists can be painful to read through, and it is easy to want to casually skim to the end or skip to the bottom altogether. However, if something is recorded in scripture, it has purpose. 
One reason that this list is so important is that Jesus's genealogy can be traced through, through these ancient legal records. We can see the bloodline of the Messiah, the promised one that would come in the future for the nation of Israel and for the world. The list of names were those who were cho the chosen nation of Israel, the people of God. Now, the specification of each family member partially fulfills the promise of numerous descendants given in Genesis 12, 2. The total number represented in the family of Israel is 70. Now, this number includes Jacob, Joseph, and Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. The number 70 is interesting because it's a symbol of completeness. In Genesis chapter 10, the number of nations listed representing the descendants of Adam is 70. And here again, we have 70 descendants representing the patriarchs, the children of the promise. These records were also very important as they served to trace the roots of all tribes and families that in later history comprised the people of God. These records were always very carefully kept. The special inheritance of the various tribes in the land of Canaan depended on the legal registry. God commanded that each man's inheritance of land should always return to him in the year of Jubilee. So a record was carefully preserved. As we move on to verse 28, we see Judah step up to lead his family. The brother who was once responsible for separating Jacob from Joseph was now in charge of bringing them back together. Judah went ahead to get directions to Goshen. And then in verses 29 and 30, we see the tearful reunion of Jacob and Joseph. The reconciliation experienced in this family is truly a demonstration of God's amazing grace. God achieved what this family could not. As great as this gaping wound was, how much sweeter the reconciling reunion. In verses 31 through 34, Joseph tells his family that he will appear before Pharaoh on their behalf. He coaches them on what to say and how to interact with Pharaoh. Joseph wants to ensure that proper respect is given to Pharaoh. And even though Joseph has been awarded power over all the land of Egypt, he doesn't want to assume more than he should and be seen as taking advantage of Pharaoh's um, or giving unfair favor to his own family. So he operates with integrity by humbly approaching Pharaoh and seeking his permission to settle his family in Goshen. Joseph instructed his brothers to be honest in describing themselves as shepherds. Joseph wanted to ensure Pharaoh that his family would not be a drain on the Egyptian economy. Goshen was likely in the eastern delta region of the Nile River. It provided excellent pasture for grazing, and it also remained segregated from the Egyptians. So Egyptians found nomads a threat, and they considered herding sheep detestable. So determining an appropriate settlement location was really important to maintain peace. In the land of Goshen, um, his family could sustain themselves and their herds once the famine ended. Pharaoh graciously invited Joseph's family to settle in the land of Goshen and even offered work to them, caring for his own livestock. Next, Joseph presented Jacob to Pharaoh. In verse 7, then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Pharaoh received Jacob, not as an inferior, but with all the respect due to his old age and the glory of his position as Joseph's father. The request for Jacob's blessing indicated that Pharaoh saw the power of God in Jacob. Pharaoh inquired of Jacob's age and he answered, the years of my pilgrimage are 130. He humbly spoke of his years as few in contrast to his forefathers and confessed he was a stranger and pilgrim on the earth. 
the important thought of pilgrimage was always present in the language of the patriarchs and became more predominant in the beautiful picture of consecrated Old Testament life. In comparison to the glory awaiting him, Jacob's days on earth were but few and sorrowful. We too are called to look at earth as our temporary dwelling place for our true citizenship is in heaven. So Joseph settled his father and family in Egypt and gave them all that they needed to live this new chapter of their nation's future in Egypt. Could they discern all of God's purposes involved? No. Had they seen anything unfold yet? No. They had to trust in what they had. God's trustworthy promises. And that brings us to our second division. An unknown future can be trusted to a known God. An unknown future can be trusted to a known God. How is God leading you in an unexpected direction? It may be a career change, a surprising ministry opportunity, or physical move. You may not know all his reasons or his purposes, but you do know his promises. They are all over the Bible. So when we don't know the reason, we can look to his trustworthy promises. When God leads you to an unknown land, as he did Jacob, remember the promise gave, God gave to Jacob. Do not be afraid. I will go with you. He did not give an explanation, just a promise. What promise of God do you need to trust in right now so that you can obey? Ask God to give you that promise and to help you believe it. No one and no thing, no crisis, no evil can stop the purposes of God from generation to generation. They are eternal because God is eternal. When you look at the beautiful masterpiece that is a piece of Ikea furniture, you do not see all the pieces and their purpose. You see the completed work functioning as it is designed. And in our lives, we don't always see the purposes of God as we move through the highs and lows that naturally occur. But having an eternal perspective with a right understanding of who God is, we can hold on to the promise that his purposes triumph for his glory and our good. As believers, we can look to him in all circumstances to be reminded that our past is redeemed and future secured because of God's good purposes. Let's pray. Father, thank you that your good purposes are always at work in our lives. Help us to be reminded of your promises scattered throughout the Bible and help us to hold on to those promises when things seem un unsure and uncertain and scary. Help us to remember who you are, eternal, unchanging, almighty, and sovereign over all things. God, we worship you, the same God who was with Jacob as with, is with us today. And we thank you for that. And it's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.